In this lesson, I'll talk about why do you need to be concerned with the cloud? A lot of organizations say, well, you know, we just got data all over the place and I want to move everything out to the cloud. Or um, maybe we want to bring everything in from the cloud. I think you really need to step back and look at why the cloud needs to be considered um, and when it shouldn't be considered. So in this lesson, um, by the end of it, I want you to uh, be able to discuss uh, what organizations are probably already running uh, in their cloud, um, explain how the cloud uh, and why the cloud should be considered, and also understand that one size does not fit all for all cloud needs. The chances are that you're already using the cloud in some capacity. Now, the video that you're watching right now is actually hosted out in the cloud. It's, um, I believe it's actually hosted on Amazon AWS. Don't hold me to that because I'm actually not sure. Uh, my guess is Coursera is hosting this out at, on AWS, but you know, that could change at any time. Um, just like we talked in previous video, uh, previous lesson, um, we could, if it, depending on their model, whether it's a platform as a service or whether it's infrastructure as a service, we could uh, easily move from one location to another or one cloud provider to another. So going back to how we're using the cloud already is email. Office, uh, excuse me, Office 365 is a huge product, a huge SaaS offering. Uh, G Suite is Gmail's solution to that as well. Chat uh, clients like Skype and Facebook and Slack are also out in the cloud, and those are um, software as a service, depending on how you're using them. Uh, files. Uh, we have Google Drive, we have OneDrive, Dropbox, Box, you name it. Um, for, for file storage, you're probably using some kind of, again, software as a service. Entertainment. Netflix, Hulu, Spotify, Pandora, and Amazon are all um, cloud providers that provide entertainment um, websites to the masses. Netflix runs on AWS. Social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, Snapchat even, are all cloud services. Enterprise cloud services also are Azure and AWS. There's many more also cloud providers out there. Uh, however, these are the most prevalent at the moment. AWS has a huge market share over this. So everyone is using the cloud in some capacity. Every organization, every business. All of your data is being processed on someone else's computer. Think about how you're watching these videos. Think about how you're accessing your email. One component out of there is being managed by somebody else. Unless you have a huge organization, which all of it encompasses um, everything on premise, then, which is very unlikely, then you're probably using the cloud in some capacity. Even large organizations like the uh, federal government is using some kind of cloud services to host information or to transfer information. Skype, for example, um, is a communication tool that we use out in the cloud to communicate with one another. Um, I, I guarantee you you're using some type of cloud provider out there. Why should you actually consider the cloud? We got into this a little bit in the previous video, but let's talk about a little bit more about disaster recovery. Disaster recovery is a big deal these days uh, because data gets exposed, data is destroyed, and we need somewhere else to put our data. So the cloud provides many different options, um, actually all three different types of services, um, they offer software as a service, like CrashPlan, for example. Uh, CrashPlan also offers um, a hybrid service as well, both on-premise and um, in the cloud. Um, and um, there's also infrastructure as a service for backup as well. Um, this could be, um, off the top of my head, I can't, 
can't actually think of a company right now, but um, there are plenty of other uh, infrastructure as a service providers that offer disaster recovery. This is important because we need to diversify where we're keeping our data and where that data is being located. So if we have a natural disaster, um, an earthquake, for example, on the West Coast, maybe the East Coast Data Center has all that information and we um, maintain business continuity because we have another, um, another source of data in another location. The cloud is great for this. We can also uh, use the cloud for simpler maintenance. Because the cloud runs in many different locations, and because we can diversify, it can be easier to maintain from system to system. Updates. Updates, especially software as a service, we generally don't have to worry about our uh, software as a service, platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service to maintain updates. Uh, think about Windows Update, for example. If you're using a, a service like Slack, for example, or let's say that you're using um, Office 365, are you worried about the updates to the underlying operating system? No, because the service provider, the cloud provider, has done that for you. You don't have to worry because usually cloud providers have already thought about how they are going to upgrade information, especially the base operating system and the base architecture to provide you the overall service. So we don't have to worry about updates. Another reason to use the cloud is the ease of interface. Um, if we are configuring like on-premise exchange, for example, to get our email, on-premise exchange may be very difficult to maintain and we may have many servers. However, if we're using Office 365 as an alternative to, uh, to exchange on-premise, the interface is much easier to use. You may lose some features and functionality like logging, for example. However, the interface is actually going to be easier um, on the cloud than it is on-premise. You also don't have to be the expert in the cloud um, or in any service, really. So software as a service, uh, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, you do not have to be an expert necessarily to operate the cloud architecture. Now, some of them, some like infrastructure as a service, for example, uh, Amazon AWS, you do have to worry about that. However, um, you don't have to be an expert in everything. What do you need to be concerned with? Your stakeholders are already using the cloud in some capacity. So if you don't have a strategy out there, chances are you're behind. Um, if you have a position already to either move fully to the cloud or move completely on premise, I would suggest you realize that it may not be one size fits all. Um, you really have to take a hard look at how you how your cloud strategy is set up. So, like I said in the previous video, if you if all your data is out in one service provider and that service provider goes away, how are you going to pull that data down and move to another provider in a day or two? It just can't be done. So, you need to have a cloud strategy. Um, in general to support your position. Also, if you're not providing the services that your organization needs, um, chances are that somebody in your organization is already using something that fits their needs. So having options out there for your stakeholders, uh, for your customers, uh, which is really what IT is all about and security is all about, you, you have customers out there. You need to make sure that they are taken care of. You don't have to fully support it, but you need to be aware of everything your organization is doing surrounding the cloud. For example, uh, the university uses, some departments use Slack. Um, we have other tools like Skype for Business and Jabber, 
which meet the needs of a majority of the requirements that certain departments have for instant communications, uh, instant one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many communications. Slack doesn't necessarily meet that um, criteria for certain groups, so they are using Slack. So are you using the free version? Are you using the paid version? And how you support it in general is going to come up with, you're, you're going to make, have to make a decision really on how uh, you're going to support that cloud service. Your company's data is already out there. No matter if you're using OneDrive, Box, Dropbox, and the sanctioned applications that you're using, such as OneDrive, like we have sanctioned OneDrive use on our campus. Dropbox is not sanctioned because the paid for version of Dropbox um, could have better security, whereas the free version of Dropbox may not have great security. So your company's data is out there and it's really up to you to figure out how you want to support uh, the data usage out there. How do you make it secure? Unsanctioned SaaS applications. Well, let's talk about this for a minute. Unsanctioned SaaS applications are scary for a, a variety of different reasons. Let's talk about these. We need to be concerned with how's the data backed up. If somebody is using Dropbox, for example, and it's not a sanctioned application, um, and the person uh, that is using Dropbox uh, leaves the organization, how are you going to get that data back? Um, who owns the data? Does your cloud provider know um, or do you have an agreement with your cloud provider that you own the data? Um, some companies actually don't. Um, how can you guarantee that they have passed security audits? Um, FISMA compliance, for example, um, or HIPAA compliance. How have they, or have they had a breach? How was the breach um, handled? Um, what about, uh, does the enterprise agreement say that, uh, say where their data is kept? Um, mostly in the case of research and controlled data is where we see this, but we do need to be concerned with data that is controlled, such as um, ITAR, for example, which is the International Trade in Arms Regulations. Um, that states anything that um, uh, weaponry, which could actually be encryption, for example, that's considered weaponry. Um, how, how are you maintaining the source code? Are you maintaining it on a service that is overseas? If you are, it may be against regulation or against the law, in fact. Um, so you really have to have a, an overall strategy of is the SaaS application that you're using sanctioned or unsanctioned and how are you using that application in your organization? If it is unsanctioned data or unsanctioned um, software as a service, uh, is, it be, is it okay? Um, we have, as a university, we have to make sure that the people that are using Dropbox, for example, which is unsanctioned and that the university doesn't pay for um, is uh, is not holding any uh, data that could be considered research data or could be um, holding um, any controlled data like ITAR, for example. All strategies surrounding the cloud are not going to be the same. So you need to lock, make sure that you lock down whatever SaaS application that you have or a cloud application that you have. Um, opening it up is another example of where we want to make sure that we have a strategy surrounding the cloud. Opening it up means that let's let other people try things out and make sure it's secure. Create a sense of openness to your organization that allows them the flexibility to use the, the cloud provider within reason and be able to come to the security office for that. Um, we must be able to enforce that policy as well. Make sure that you're, not only that your stakeholders are aware of this, 
but also make sure that senior management is behind it as well. Um, are we going to not enforce policy as well? Maybe that's where unsanctioned cloud applications come in. What about users um, that decide just to ignore everything that you say? This is a hard one because then we have to enforce policy. And uh, maybe there's not a solution. Maybe Dropbox is the only solution that we have that hosts large files and that we can collaborate outside of our organization. Um, maybe the case. So really have a uh, strategy because one size doesn't fit all.